Boker Tov or Lila Tov or Erev Tov, either one. Good to see you or hear you or you're you're good to hear me and see me. Maybe yeah, they're not. They're not. We're not. Nachi Gordon them. here, Meaningful People Podcast. Hey, check out our new album art. How about that, huh? How I, about I, that? I feel like you have like ADHD with this intro. <laughs> like you're I know. everywhere. So much in my mind. <laughs> like, Nachi Gordon, Meaningful People, uh, Erev Tov, new <laughs> album art. Well, new Rabbi Hanach Teller. Yeah. Hanoch, Hanoch, Rav Hanoch. Either Hanoch or Rav Hanoch Teller. Who knows? But it, the facts are this guy, this yeah, rabbi, this Chashav Yid, has 18 children. He's made over 100 Shaduchim. And this is a really good episode, guys. We we able to sit down with. I, yeah, yeah I, I personally had a lot of fun with him and, and getting to know him better. And he's someone that clearly has revolutionized the from world with his books yeah and and the the, the he's the og author yeah yeah and as well as the films he's made and now he has you know we'll talk about in the outro the podcast that he created um it, it, he's an incredible person and he's not stopping he's just going further and further and this is really cool insight into who he is yes yeah, so sit back uh maybe pour yourself a drink drink um, of what i don't know a drink of amr you know? You're plugging our our, <laughs> our our sponsor in the beginning. Yeah, drink yeah, AMR. Sure. So take a drink of some AMR yeah. and enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, we are here today on this uh, little gloomy Sunday with the... One of the most well-known authors, I'm sure you're cringing inside as I say that, uh, <laughs> Rabbi Hanoch Teller, originally from, Nachi, you told Vienna? me. Vienna? Yeah. That's you know, true. I mean, it sounds yeah. very exotic. I wasn't right? there so long, but uh, I'm from Vienna. I was born there. Uh, people said, oh, my mother, my grandmother. The fact of the matter is, after World War I, there were 180,000 Jewish refugees in Vienna. Most everyone, if you're not of Sephardic ancestry, has some direct connection to Vienna, but I was actually born there. Mm. Not after World War One, and not after well, it was after World War One, and it was after <laughs> World War Two. I had this funny line. I just said, I gave a tour of Yad Vashem last week, and I, when I teach, I always, I'm an educator, and I say funny things, and to, and then to entertain myself, I always think to myself something funnier. <laughs> so in Yad Vashem, I can't, but it was just so funny. I have to share this with you, or I guess the audience. I was talking about the. the problem with the currency in Germany, it was runaway inflation. And I compared, you know, before World War I, a loaf of bread cost 69 Fennig. After World War I, it cost three and a half million marks. That's the kind of runaway inflation. So and as soon as I said World War I, I thought to myself, gosh, that, that would have been such a depressing term to say at the time. Right. That's why it's called the Great War. Right. right. <laughs> so I shared it with them. You normally I just keep these things to myself. Right. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, we, we, my connection here is uh, we were neighbors in Eretz Yisrael, so I, I definitely know you're a side And for, we go back. And we go back, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, yeah. and my connection is I have many of your books on my bookshelf. <laughs> I'm sure as many as Jews in the, in the <laughs> world. <laughs> An author of, of more than 28 books. Um, I'd say like the, the OG author in, in <laughs> Kali Yisrael, the original. So it's really an honor to have you sitting here with one of your um very famous books, Heroic Children, Untold Stories of the Unconquerable. Uh, I want that's for I want to save that for the end because okay. there's a lot to say about that. Um, but you you actually you we were talking alone. You sent me an article about like how you got into storytelling or just how you got started on your path. Oh, okay. So yes, yeah, recently a certain magazine asked me to write the hand think watershed moments. So my watershed moment, it's a long story, but I guess, hey, we're here, so uh, yeah, let's do I'll it. try and t telescopically condense. But when I came as a rookie bacher to Israel, uh, for the first band as Manim in the summer, I wanted to do something a little more productive. There was contemporaneously, people would go on Tiulim, and I wanted to do something which may have an impact on someone. Through a connection of a connection to a connection, I got up in touch with the Rav in Kiryat Shmona. They had had a fiasco the year before. There was some program which came there, and... The Jewish agency pulled out and people were left there. It was really catastrophic. And he said, anything you'll do here, which is mildly successful, will be majorly productive. And I thought there were Sephardi kids there that, uh, Kachmanat is a development town. That's a spiffy Israeli term for an undeveloped town. They're usually on the border. And uh, it's Sephardic immigrants, very low economic level. And so I went up there and my plan was to teach these kids a little Yahadut, that was the plan. I'm there only on my second day, and I hear the unmistakable sound of a basketball dribbling 
and this Yankel Doodle English. Now, Kiach Mona is the end of the world. It's a, a little further, you're in Lebanon. You're in <laughs> Fatalin. I mean, it's, and, uh, and missiles. I mean, you, uh, Kiach Mona is the very end. And what were they doing? Oh, here, this is a real English. And I see these guys, you know, with the the long basketball shorts and the Nike and the t-shirts, slogan t-shirts, and uh, say, hey guys, what are you doing here? And like, they're yawning, they're, they're very bored. And they're on this program. And I said to them, I, it was a little bit too direct, I guess, said, hey, would you like to learn a little Torah? And they were so bored, if I would have taught them basket weaving, they would have been intrigued. <laughs> and uh, they said, sure. And uh, so I started teaching them. And they were on this Ulpan, there's a program called Sherut La'am, Mayor Shuster Zakhanov Racha renamed or nicknamed that program Sherut Le Satan because there was a deliberate attempt to take these kids, college, all college graduated, directly. They didn't go to Shalayim, not even on the first stop, second stop, all the way up north in this development town. And they did a lot of things. I don't like to speak bad about things and I don't want to speak bad about Jewish agency programs, but there was definitely an agenda here which was uh, very anti religious. So much so, there is in Israel, there's a law uh, you cannot do kfiyah datit. You cannot force religion on someone. There's also, you're not allowed to via antidatit. And I was quite certain that this was falling within this rubric. And so I asked them if they minded if I would teach. And they said, sure, you can teach them because they knew the kids were bored. They had this uh, Turkish, they had this theater there where they showed Turkish war epics every two weeks. They had nothing to do. These guys, they had classes in the morning. They had Ruku uh, Am once a week. They had folk dancing at night. And these were intelligent people. One of my students from there, who I'm close with to this day, is the foremost psychiatrist in America. Foremost, foremost, uh, what's the word for legal? Uh, legal psychiatrist is a word for it. Uh, and he, if they have a case where they need someone to come, uh, mm -hmm. a legal opinion, he is the I one. would guess, but I know I'd be like so off. I'd mm -hmm. be like, dentist? You're like, nope, that's totally not the word you're looking for. <laughs> no, I, I know that's not the word. word. It's, all right. Anyway. It'll come to you. It's funny, I'm working <laughs> work on, on a book that has to do with legal terms. Forensic, foremost forensic psychiatrist okay. in America. I was not going to get that word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, he and his wife, very, very accomplished people. But uh, there, we met over there and we still have a relationship. Anyway, so the story goes like this. So uh, I asked them if they wanted me to teach. They said, sure. And then all of a sudden, I saw the old pond where they were staying didn't want me there. They didn't want them to learn Torah. So the, the, they forbade me to come. The good part was it then took on the mystique of going underground. And uh, so then we had these classes that were underground. And uh, what happened there, I always had this feeling all my life, if something happens to you, there's a reason for it. And I had to let people know about it. And the only way to publicize it was to uh, write about it. I'd never written before, but no one else was going to write it for me. So I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, da, yeah, 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 draft after draft. <laughs> I remember making, you know, flotillas of paper airplanes from all my drafts in my room in the mirror. I was like <laughs> writing this. And finally I submitted it and ended up going simultaneously in two different uh, magazines. And then as soon, I just had to publicize it. It was publicized. And then people said, hey, what do you write about next? I never thought about writing anything else. And so I ended up writing something else and then I started writing and those, there weren't so many writers in those days. That's pretty wild though. You, you went from not probably not writing anything until you were tw 23, 24? About 19. About 19? Okay, yeah. close. And, <laughs> and then you write like 28 books? That's, well, so, so let me say, we're, we're still yeah, in the middle of the story. Like, yeah, so yeah. after I started writing, uh, then people asked me to do reportage and, you know, go write a story about this and write a story about that. And I was, in, this was, primarily I was doing this for the Jewish Observer, Allah Shalom. And I was happy to do it, but I saw, I felt that my writing style was more given over to what's called in Hebrew, Amami, more story-like. Mm -hmm. I started writing stories. And then people said, hey, you wrote a story, why don't you tell us a story? No connection to my last name. So I started yeah. telling stories, and that's that's how it started. And you were the, I guess the the first one to really delve into Jewish writing store, stories, yeah, soul I mean, stories. I think. You, well, that was that's a genre we created. There the, was no such thing. You created that genre. I know you're saying we humbly. <laughs> well, that was you. <laughs> you started it. We. I mean, yeah, yeah, well, I'm yeah. not so royal. Okay. <laughs> and. Um, and but but and we, we, I'm sure we're going to talk more about your writing, and I want to bring up the, your your book. But you also then started speaking as well, right? That's one led to the other. People started to know me from my writing. I started writing at a young age, and I published a lot. And wherever I went, people used to say to me, 
Chanoch Teller, are you his son? They didn't, it never occurred to them that this 23-year-old or 22-year-old or 25-year-old had written already by that point six, seven books. <laughs> so uh, even though it's the same name, it didn't make sense. We had twins. The people mm. asked us, uh, well, it wasn't common then to have twins. They said, well, let's say it's very common. <laughs> it wasn't so common. They said, what's the age difference? I said, three months. They said, oh. You know, like, <laughs> people <laughs> weren't thinking. So they thought, are you, Hanukta, are you his son? No, I said we're married to the same woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now that we're we're on there, I wanted to bring this up at a certain point, but yeah, I asked you. Yeah, and Nachi asked if we could bring this up, and I, I spoke to you, and you said we could. That the fact that can I know her? You have eighteen children. I can't deny it. Yeah, right. No, so <laughs> that's, that's, no, it's 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 first of all, like it's what's probably, it? how many people like how many people in the world do you think have eighteen children? If you'd had to guess. It's got to be a Never stat. thought about it. I have a son living here. I'm sure and, you have uh, a son living everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are connected. I'll tell you, my, remind me to tell you, my, my greatest nachas is that, uh, so my son says, wherever they go, people ask him, what's it like to be one of 18? And he always answers back, what's it like to be one of three? You know, yeah. this is what he's used to. He grew up, true. <laughs> he grew up in such a family. And the kids really, we were the center of everything. Um, like my kids, at, at midnight, he would get out of Yeshiv Katana and Bait Vagan, he would, the bus would stop working then. He would walk home. Now, we live so fetched. You know, it's not a large apartment. I'm not complaining. It's fine. It's small. But he would walk back. I'm talking about like in 46. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was a two-bedroom apartment. We had already nine children there. Wow. And uh, wow. he would walk back. Only nine? Okay, at that point, yeah. <laughs> at that I'm, point. I'm not yeah. going to do the math, but nine, <laughs> nine kids, two bedrooms. <laughs> so we don't, you know, as long yeah. as they fall asleep, we weren't particular. You know, <laughs> you know, Kitchen, uh, he's in bathtub, the kitchen, right, yeah. right. <laughs> No, one girl was really into the bathtub. I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, make a long story long. Uh, he would walk back at night because he wanted to sleep on his bed. And you'd think, you know, his bed. We're talking a mattress, maybe yay thick. But the kids loved it at home. And they would never play at someone else's house. Like all the fun and all the actions in our house, all the neighbor. Mm -hmm. So in our small little apartment, everybody would come and play with our kids because there was so much more action. So, so what's like the age, the oldest, youngest? What's the ages? All right, I'm 27. <laughs> Why okay. do I always laugh at that? And my oldest is about uh, maybe 13 years older than me. And so the, the range is probably about, so about is, 21 years between the oldest to the youngest. Wow. I have grandchildren that are older than my children. Right. That makes sense. I mean, your wife was, I guess, pregnant for a lot of her life. Yeah. I never thought of it that <laughs> I, way. I, I was actually by, you your, I was by your apartment once and I was looking at one of the picture frames and, and, and I was like schmoozing with your wife and, and I'm like, so 18. She's like, yep. Yeah. And she's like, you know what? It's it, she has such a like. She's like, yeah, like it's not a big deal. And I'm like, really? She's like, it's a mirchasham by you. And I'm like, amazing. I was <laughs> really like not sure things, to answer. Though. It's like, oh, Rechanak Tyler, big writer, speaker. Has 18 kids, by the way. Oh, what? Really? Like, that's like... <laughs> we could bring you on just to talk about this No, because honestly, alone. I think in society, in the world, in the regular world, if you have 18 kids, you have a, you have a TV show on TLC, you know, like mm -hmm. a reality show about your life, and you just, you have 18 kids. There's two famous stories. I don't, I, I really don't like talking about children. My wife, I, I love them, man. Yeah. But, uh, there's two one well-known stories. I once got onto a bus in Shalim with nine kids. Okay. And the driver said, no, why don't you, why don't you leave half of them at home? I said, did <laughs> <laughs> that's great and the other one was in queens one summer we were in america i was producing a film so i brought the whole family to america the whole family yeah okay and we were in summer in queens <laughs> and so some german tourist stopped me i can spot a german accent anywhere and uh, she said aren't you ashamed of yourself so many children ruled short, you know food shortage ecological problems i said got a point <laughs> when i have six million i'll rethink Ooh. Yeah. wow is that the goal <laughs> <laughs> how have i you said you have a naha story uh, my naha story is is that uh, a lot of my kids many of my kids live right around right around us so in the park in my lot dafna we live in our the same neighborhood hmm. which is it's easier for the Kablan to make a different name and charge more <laughs> so in the park in my lot dafna i have a lot of daughters and daughters-in-law they all they're with their kids it's sort of a team. And uh, so I've heard this many times. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound so which is so ego gratifying, but it, uh, it is for me that I've heard many people comment that if one of my, one of the grandchildren falls down, one of the kids falls down and pick, so a mother will pick it up and scoop and kiss it. And people say, you never know if it's the mother or it's an aunt or a sister. 
So that's from Inachas. Like, that it's nice. incredible. That's so amazing. I, I don't I, I, I don't know why I want to talk about so much about this 18 kids thing. I think it's, it's such a rarity, but it's also, you're, you're not, you don't look like someone who's like stressed and, and like, <laughs> you should see my wife. <laughs> no, no, she's not stressed. She's, you don't look stressed to me at all, but from my knowledge of her, she's even more how, how non-stressed raise, than you. She's never raised her voice in her life. In she her is life. very so 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 How do you raise 18 children? And I, I, can't, I don't even know how many grandchildren mm -hmm. how do you raise 18 kids how do you how do you give the attention and how, how does that someone happen? asked me once how many children do i have this is my usual answer i say one one baruch one Maishi, one sarah you know it's mm. that's the idea it's each one is an individual and my wife always says that after five it gets easier people say how could you do it i can't manage with two so she says after five it gets easier all my kids were involved everybody had duty and you know and you have, there's, there's nursing and there's all kinds of problems and feeding babies and changing everybody's involved my father mixed it. Like we're one of four. And another my father who, who knows you. Shout out to my father who's listening to this. Hi, Danny. Love you. Hi. Um, I love you. I love you. He mixes I love, up I, love our, you. I love you too. <laughs> he mixes up our names. One of eight, like 18. Do you, do you mix up their names? The funny names? thing is, I, even pick names. <laughs> I have one name. You're going to find this humorous. I have one name. I use them for all of them. And they all know. I don't know how. They all know who I'm talking to. What do you say? Jack. Really? Boy and girl. I just, hey, Jack. How, how, how many boys? Oh. How many boys? Do you 11 have? boys. 11, wow. 11 boys. And you have one, there's one set of twins? Two sets of twins. Two sets of twins. Oh, nice. Oh, is he, oh uh, easy yeah, yeah. now. That's oh. what I always say. Yeah. Oh, no. oh yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's only easy 14 labors. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I want to go back and talk to you a little about your writing because you, you wrote a few biographies, but interestingly, your biographies were your relationships with these Gedalim. Correct. I mean, I've written about people who I'm not so familiar with, or I didn't even know, very rarely. But my biographies, which are most famous, are the ones where I had a strong personal connection, and which makes the book unhumbly powerful, because it's not just paper, it's my soul. I wrote the biography of Nussan C. Finkel uh, from the mirror. I learned with him longer than anyone else. That sounds very impressive, and I'll correct that right away. It's a fact. I learned with him longer than anyone else. But that's because people graduated and they went from his year up to Reb mm -hmm. I just stayed by him. I learned the whole machzor by him. Really? So, um, How many years was, was that? Seven years. Seven years. So I, I learned the whole yeshiva machzor with Reb Nassim Tzvi. And at what point in his life was that? Those from when to when? That would have been 19, 1977. Take a little break and then picked up again in 19... Uh, Again, picked up again in 1978. Till, uh, what till can, I learned with him Bechabusa for a while. Well, actually. can you tell? I mean, we, we obviously know a bunch about him. Yeah, but, but I mean, we know what people know. But, but, we, yeah, could you tell us more about him? You spent a lot of time with him. I mean, the truth is I, I wrote a biography, so I can recommend. But uh, he was, his love of the students and for Torah was, was totally remarkable. There was a student who, uh, someone once asked him, I mean, there's a Shiva today, if I'm not mistaken, has over 8,500 students. Mm -hmm. That's pretty incredible. And someone said, in his day, it wasn't that large. I mean, it, was, it was only 6,000. Right? <laughs> so uh, someone said, do you, do you know all their names? He said, no. But I can tell you, I love them all. Mm -hmm. And that's a true statement from a man who spoke only the truth. There was a boy in Yeshiva. He was a, he was a rookie. And he had developed, and I can't describe this accurately because it Baruch I've been spared this. So he had a... A problem in his gum. I forgot. An, an as an as uh, forensic. No, a, abs, abscess in his gum. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And abs, guys, I, I just came off a plane. So, <laughs> and last night, I finally got to sleep, and I got a call from Eretz Yisrael, and I, you know, I didn't think of turning. I got a call. I, I made a shidduch last night, or they got engaged last night. Wow, Mazel Tov. But it's unusual shidduch. It's uh, in this family. It's I don't know. What do you say more than a hat trick? Uh, Strabo Hatrick. Yeah. <laughs> this, so this is the fourth one you made in this in family. This family. So you, you made over 100 Shazachim. For sure. So, but no, listen, we're not done yet. Four in this one family. And the Kala, I was the Kala, the Kala and her mother and her parents. Oh my so really? Second generation. Wow. With one, so that's a good stat. That oh is really gosh. cool. Okay, so, you have so that, he, has, he, has, he has an abscess in his gum. Okay, so the guy oh, has that. that screaming soprano pain. You know? Right. And so uh, they told the Rashiva, it's like 6 30 at night in the evening, and the Rashiva says, we'll go to my dentist. So he takes him to the dentist, and the fellow is, uh, you know, and like all dental work, it always gets worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. 
And so the dentist pins him down with one hand, and Rustin Svi, who has advanced Parkinson's, held him down. You know, he tried to hold down the other hand. And the boy, who was in such pain, clenched his eyes closed, and he held down to Roshiva's hand, and his fingernails pierced the skin. Right. And when the procedure was finally over, and he opened his eyes, he saw Roshiva's hand dripping blood. He said, Roshiva, why didn't you say something? He said, because I realized your pain was worse than mine. Wow. And that's just reflective of the kind of person that he was. You know, I, in, in, this, in the stories you read about him, he was Nathan from Skokie. Nate. And, Nate from Skokie. And, like, could you bring Maybe, us a little actually. bit in that, like, how normal, I guess, he was? I mean, I, I told you, I learned with him about Russo, so uh, at night, uh, one's mine. And uh, it was before Pesach, and so I was helping clean up his boydom. Mm-hmm. And I found their golf clubs, you know, like <laughs> the real Yankee Doodle. I mean, yeah. Not in the one way to detract from the right. no, I think country. That's why it's the, 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 the ultimate rags to riches story that we all relate to. And the story is the rags to riches tale. The catch is, I don't want to belittle the inspiration, is that his last name was Finkel. So that was his in. But uh, he came from, you know, from a co-ed high school where he was on the, not only was on the on the varsity basketball starting team, Every year, NCSY Kolel would go to his house for, for and he, he would speak to them. Large dining room table, and they'd sit around. And he'd say, oh, he, if a routine worked, he, he repeated it. And he said, how many of you from the Midwest? And 18 hands went up. How many of you from Chicago? 11 hands went up. And how many of you went to the academy? We're here. And then uh, seven hands went up. And uh, how many of you were, he said, I went to the academy, and then like a couple jaws drop. And how many of you were on the basketball team? And then uh, five hands went up. How many of you were starters and two hands went up? And he said, I was too. And then everyone, clunk, 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 clunk. Mm. Then he had him rewind them, we wanted them, and he then went in for the kill. It's wild. And, and, and he could relate to everyone. i just tell you one more story. It's the same yeah, thing. Sure. He spoke, for reasons I don't know, and I literally, figuratively wrote the book. He came to speak in Skokie in 2003, in Chicago. Chicago's a town of very benevolent, magnanimous, philanthropic mm-hmm. individuals. And he had to raise a lot of money, enormous budget, and very generous time. I don't know. He only went there once. But the people in Chicago, like their proudest son had come back. They were so happy to have Nussan Svi. And he learned one year in Skokie. So he came to speak in, in Skokie. And for those boys, like the hero of the Jewish world was, yeah. was now there. And he was so frail in his condition that he couldn't go down in the wheelchair, down the steps. I'm describing to Yeshiva, you don't know. But from the front, there's a glass door, which they opened up for him. And they wheeled him in, and everyone got like as close as they possibly could to hear what he said. And he said to them, I too am from Chicago, and I too love baseball, and I became a Rosh Hashiva. And that was it. But he had mainlined them with such inspiration. Other speakers with histrionics and gesticulations for hours and passionate speaking could not do what he did in those 15 seconds. Hmm. And they'll never forget it the rest of their lives. That's very spoken to and and there's I know we could spend another five hours in Rav Dustin Svi, but mm-hmm. you you also wrote uh, biographies on other good yes, that I, you. Uh, uh, Shlomo Zalman Orbach, I was privileged to learn by for fourteen years, and uh, he had a very very pr- profound impact upon me. Upon uh, Shlomo Zalman, I was Zoch for nine years to carry his Gemara home. I'm very proud of that from from Shir. He gave a Shir for Balabatim, in Shari Chesed. I was the junior member by about forty years. And these people, week after week, Shlom Zalman, everyone knew. In the family, you don't make a simcha on a Sunday night because he didn't miss that year. So I had a, developed a close relationship with him. I mean, he, was, he came to my chasna. He, uh, he was, I, was, I was privileged to be in his... I tell my kids, uh, I'm doubt some of my kids are very intelligent and learned. And sometimes we have to make decisions. And I say, we're going to do this. And they challenge me because la lacha, you, there's different ways. And I tell them, I can't trump their learning. But my answer always is, I smelled Shomzalman sweat. And it gives me one foot up. I had that kind of experience of being close to him. So it gives me certain guidance in life of what to do. I also had a, I was also to have a very good relationship with, with Nissan Alpert, Sholem mm. That's our connection here also. Yeah, Jay Tupper. Yeah, Jay Tupper. Tupper. Uh, so that's how I got to know your father. He ah. opened the door to your father. And you, oh. It was Jay Tepper. Uh, and then we begin white, white, 
White House. White House White Estates. Estates, of course. Shout wonderful, out. wonderful yeah. place. Uh, it's from this and Alpert. Okay, so from this... Uh, so I, this could only happen in the 1980s. I had a relationship with him that could have only happened then. I was never in his shear, but people recorded his shear for me. And I would drive. I didn't have a tape deck. I would, whenever I would drive, I'd listen to his shear. And I had such a relationship with him that I was already learning in Eretz Yisrael. And he got, he, he had a horrible, horrific cancer, which got progressively worse. And I would call him up once a week and I would just say, you know, Rafur Shlema. That was my whole conversation. And then in the end, I flew in to be here. And I was with Zohar to be here at the very end. I was, I was the only one in the room. But it's, it's you, it's yes, neshama. Wow. Uh, so, uh, so his biography there also is because it was, I knew him. It wasn't just writing paper. Is there a story about Rav Nissen that you uh, have in your uh, mind? A quickie I can't think of exactly. Okay. Uh, It'll come up in the middle. Uh, right. Yeah, the, the, he, there's a fellow named, his name escapes me now also, Dove, a wonderful fellow. And that, he used to be his host in Far Rockaway. And uh, so he came and came, <laughs> you could think of it these days. He would take a train from the Lower East Side, the A train, up to Far Rockaway. I mean, that, that is a... <laughs> I don't know if people, how many people are, are local or not, but the subway is not the most pleasant place in the world. The A train went from one bad neighborhood to another bad neighborhood to a much worse neighborhood to the rifle shooting capital of the world. I mean, like, it went, right. and there he is with blinking lights and he's learning the whole time. And so one f freezing frigid peppermint patty night, it's snowing and sleeting and hailing and pouring. And he had a shear and he comes to the, give the shear and uh, so no one figured he would take a subway in this kind of weather. So finally one person, I think his name is Moshe Hirth, looked out and he said, I saw a light on the shul. And he traipsed over and he said, Rebbe, what are you doing here? He said, we have a shear. He said, but Rebbe, in this weather, you know, we can learn by ourselves. He said, that's what I was afraid of. So uh, he wanted wow. to be the Rebbe. So he came out. There's a story. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> We'll be right back to the rest of the episode. But first, Nachi wants to tell you guys all a story that he just told me right before, and it's about AMR. Nach, what's the story? <laughs> oh. um, so the story goes like this. There once was a king in a town. Yeah. And the king's son had the sniffles. This is, by the way, taking place in 2021. 2021. And what's today's date? This is May 26. So this is taking place May 26. At what time is it? One thirty-two. So this is happening right now as I say it. Um, and the king's son was, was sick and there was like so many pharmacies to choose from. Mm -hmm. And the king said, you know what, for me, for the king of the town, I'm going with the best pharmacy in all of all the lands. And he goes up to AMR. He goes, here he, here he, I thy would like some thy AMR pharmacy. And, and they're like, bro, it's 2021. <laughs> what are you doing? And they're like, yeah, just take NyQuil. You don't, you don't need anything. But if the king's yeah, it turns, son. <laughs> it turns out, it, no, it turns out Neba, he, wa he wasn't. He wasn't a king. He he lived, uh, you know. He was a crazy person, yeah. and he thought. But still, no, but, but even he, the crazy yeah. people know no, so that it's, AMR it's is actually the best. a deeper story. He was a crazy person who was actually in a psych ward, and AMR was the one providing him with his medication. Ah, so like the pills that AMR provided made him think like a king. So, are you senile? Are you delusional? Do you want to have? like amazing delusion I and hallucinations. Like, yeah, no, I, I don't think we should stand behind <laughs> what you're saying. That's totally not true. Everything we said is made up. I know you're like, what? Oh my gosh, Nachi, that story sounded really real. It's not true. It's not made up. It's and real in my head. I, it kind of also, I don't know how politically correct it was. <laughs> but the point is, our point is that AMR is the best pharmacy. We actually got a message this past week. This is true. Yeah. Um, by the way, if anyone ever has a problem with AMR or something like that, like, hey, I'm trying to get through, you could DM us or AMR to like publicly tweet it. We don't recommend it because for any business. We're pretty much the front office for AMR. No, so. <laughs> we really. So someone reached out to us and said, hey, but I'm trying to get through. And I, 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 I think it was just a very busy day. And I reached out to to me Lee, and he said give them my cell phone number yeah. and and have them white call glove me right away. service no really really so like no you know i'm saying the story because you know what like are they perfect no but no business is perfect but they care and that's that's what you need 
because... And they won't make the same mistakes twice. No. Yeah. Oh, my. They're so good. They're bad. so good. So, guys, head to amrfarmrx.com. If you're still from the Stone Age, pick up a phone, 848-222-1110. That's 848-222-1110. And this pharmacy will change your life. Now, back to this episode. So, you mentioned in uh, in passing there about Shaduchim. And you, you've made... In, you know, do you hun- know? Do you know how many Shaduchim you've yeah. made? Because I, I, I saw a number with over 100. Uh, that's for sure. I, that's I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the number. I think it's closer. You're to very into like big numbers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> what What do you like attribute that to? Is it just oh, very simple? Is it just like no? I try. You try, and that's the message for everyone. We all have to try. There's a big problem. You have to try. Three years ago, I devoted a year of my life to uh, doing something significant. Insofar as everyone who listens knows quote unquote, the Shidduch crisis. Mm-hmm. That refers to the Shiva world. And it's a big problem and it's getting attention, it's getting funding. I'm much more concerned about what's going on in the modern Orthodox world, which may be called, if you wish, uh, AKA uh, the Upper West Side. And I fear that everyday people are getting further rather than closer to marriage. And I was so troubled about it. Let me just tell a story if I may. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm ticklish. My phone is ringing. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, anyway, so the story goes like this. Uh, a chassid turned to his rebbe and said, Rebbe, I want you to daven. and I want you to pray that my wife should die. He said, what? Yeah, I want you to daven. my wife. What are you talking about? He said, listen here. He said, I'm a poor man. If I have to give her a divorce, it'll cost me a fortune. But if she dies, it doesn't cost me a penny. The rebbe said, I have a better idea. Chazal teach that if you pledge money to tzedakah, Within a year, your spouse will die. I said, Rebbe, that's brilliant. It was right for Rosh Hashanah. He pledged 500 rubles to Tzedakah. The Gaboyim came on Sunday. He said, I'm not, 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 but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. That happened Rosh Hashanah time. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. Half a year later, he goes, Rebbe, Rebbe, it's almost Purim. She hasn't even sneezed yet. He said, Oi, I forgot to tell you. It only works if you don't want it to work. Not am I supposed to do. I suggest you go out and buy her a real fancy Delancey gift. Maybe this will help things. He goes out and he's desperate. He buys her a fancy Delancey schmancy gift. She can't believe it. He hasn't bought her anything from the year they're married. She makes him a gourmet meal, which he loves. He buys her another gift, another gourmet meal, another gift, another gourmet meal. By the end of the year, they're lovebirds. Oh, Rebbe, Rebbe, I don't want her to die. Says, way out. What's that? You have to give the tzedakah. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Not enough to talk about it. But you have to concretize. You have to do something. So that's sort of my motto. I want, like everybody feels bad, but I want to do something. So I decided what has, something has to be done. So I took upon myself this challenge. Again, this was three years ago. And one of the problems is, is that singles despise single events. So we sort of had to trick them into coming to this. And I was so concerned that it pulled, we pulled it off the right way. I had a lot of focus groups with young people to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm already 27. Hmm. And so I had to figure out, I, I didn't even know what, what, poppers are and sushi and what's going to get them to come and who are the entertainers and so Charlie Harari came and uh, David Pelkovitz and these are people I admire tremendously but it's also it was this focus groups told me these ones Eitan Katz performed mm-hmm. and it was we did it during a Sarasame Chuba we called it Chuva in the City and so in the end we produced the film which three issues that I think if singles would see this it would help them lose their single status and that was a very successful event we uh Got nearly a thousand people under one roof. And the history, do you like numbers? This was unheard of in uh, as far as It's kind of like a trick. Like you got them to go to a singles event that it was technically a singles event, but you kind of. Yeah, we packaged it very, very differently. Yeah. They didn't know what they were coming for. There are a lot of people who who try to make shidduchim, but are they just you know the shooting blanks? They're not successful. Like, what do you what no. would you say to them? Uh, shooting blanks. Uh, you have to try. I mean, I never will just. Uh, the expression I use is to throw a name. That's that's not fair to anyone. Right. I think about. So you invest it. a lot of time in it. Yeah, I also Baruch have good pool. I know of a lot of people, uh, and if I think of an idea, I, I could show you. I mean, in my wallet. I have to drive in America, so I'm not used to carrying a wallet. <laughs> but uh, I was worried because I just came from, run- I was running before oh I came gosh. here. That's a big wallet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all names of people for Shaduchim. That's Oh, it's not dollar bills. It's- no, there's no money here. <laughs> it's all names of... Uh, oh, wow. I mean, I, have to, I don't have to show this on the camera, but it's, uh, gosh. 
I'm trying to figure out the smallest list. Yeah. Uh, th those are all lists. Yeah. No. Why? Why is that? Because I need to have. I need to have it right away. Because if you if you want to do something, I don't know if this shows you anything, but uh, wow. Yeah. Those are so if you, if you don't write it down, how are you going to remember? I, mean, I guess people have good memories, but or they put in their phone. Do you but know? I, I just want to have. You know, well, that's you young guys, but uh, right, right. I you're just want to have. You're twenty-seven. Not that old. Yeah. But okay, so but I, you have you do have an advantage. Something I do want to talk about is the fact that you know so many people because you teach in a lot of places. We saw at like every seminary at a certain point in your life, you're teaching in seventeen seminaries. Is that at one point in my life? That's a lot, and and I know my wife. Right. Before I got here, my wife's like, "Oh, you're like he was my teacher." Like, mm -hmm. I feel like there's so many people that you were their teacher. I must tell you, it's a liability. I walked. We are. I don't know if people are aware of this. We're being filmed here in uh, Cedarhurst. Yeah. So I was Shabbos. I slept in Woodmere because we made a Shalom Zacher for a grandson in Lawrence, and then I have a very close friend, Dr. Benji Kripka, made us Ufroth in Farakaway. So I walked. Now. I'm a runner. I can definitely walk. It's not. It's not that bad. It's uh, an hour walk. Right. It took me three hours, I think, because really? wherever I stop, wherever I go, people are stopping me. I, I taught them. I know them. They read something. <laughs> it's a little bit of a liability. I tell people when you walk with me, it takes time. Do, and mm. you, do you remember everyone? Like I do not. No. Uh, I, I'm an old one. My old term memory. My long term memory is pretty good. So I do remember. I, I can tell a girl usually. I, if I don't remember anyone, I'll tell her where she sat in class. Hmm. Like you know. Well, what's what's uh, what do you take out of that that you you've you teach you have taught and you teach in so many seminaries that? Well, I also I try to be a good teacher. Teacher means not just conveying the material, but like it's very rare if a student of mine hasn't come over for Shabbos. What it's, does that mean? Be a good teacher. What does that look like? A relationship, and I'm not just trying to convey material. I mean, I try to be very animated about what I'm teaching. Even now, I'm teaching more, much more difficult things. Uh, I'll get to that in a moment, but. Uh, you know, you, it's a fundamental difference. You can teach chemistry, and it doesn't matter if you have a relationship or not. You can teach algebra, it doesn't matter if you have a relationship. But when you're teaching yahadas, there has to be a relationship. That's part of the Masara. Uh, and the students know that I care about them. I think they all know that. And that's why they'll call me from 15 years later, 20 years later, and ask me questions. I may not know the answers, and often I may not, but uh, I'll help them work out uh, the proper solution. You said that you teach harder material now? I mean, I, one of the classes I teach on Holocaust, so it's not something necessary. Well, I try, my whole point of Holocaust teaching is that people should be able to relate. Otherwise, it's not meaningful. We want to make sure that everyone knows the story of the Aztecs, the Incas, but it's a totally dead story. They are no more. We don't want our story to be a dead story. Uh, I don't want to sound too sharp, but as it says in Tehillim, or we say on Halil, Lo HaMesim Haleluka, Without sounding too sharp, without life, death death has no future. So I want to make it that it's a live story. It's not a dead story. It's not just statistics. That's here. Let me tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when the war was over, uh, I'm a senior docent in Yad Vashem. So, uh, well, for those who don't know, I clearly know what a senior docent is. But for those who don't know what a senior docent is, <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm a, it means I'm a tour guide in Yad Vashem. Oh, okay, cool. And I've been doing this for Why many years. Why don't I just say tour guide? <laughs> Senior docent. It's called, the word for tour guide in, in a museum is called a docent. Okay, that's cool. It wasn't. <laughs> uh, anyways, make a long story long with uh, tour guiding. So I'm, I'm involved with Yad Vashem, even though actually I volunteer there, but I'm there for a long time. And uh, I thought that the Holocaust is the most, uh, everyone knows it's the most documented crime in history. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we're in a race against time. The survivors are dying out, and uh, even with all the documentation, there was one area which I thought was not covered, and that was when the war was over, everyone was very desperate to tell over, understandably, the story how they had suffered, how they'd been betrayed, and the story which had not been told, yet needed to be told, is the story of children. They didn't tell it then and not been told. So I took upon myself this mission. I traveled around the world, and uh, literally around the world more than once, gathering the stories and also, the mind played tricks. People, as a rule, tried to forget what happened. And I had to make sure that the story was accurate. In the end, we came up with nine stories from across the Holocaust kingdom, boys and girls, religious, not religious. And that resulted in heroic children. Uh, so we put the book together. It took about 14 years to write. I exaggerate not. 
That's yeah. that's probably that's longer than the average. Oh <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, how come? Well, why was that? What was it? Was because when I'm writing was... stories and which are true stories, but I took I take all kinds of liberties. I'll change names, change locations, and if I hear a story today, and I write about it four years later. And it's a couple which had an argument. That whole story just develops in my mind. I already know what color dress she's wearing, and I know that he didn't like his coffee. And, <laughs> and by the time I write it, 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 it became so much more expanded. Here, and also our training in Yad Vashem, is that you have to be extremely accurate. The book is meticulously researched. And then after I wrote it, there were people in the scholarly community who were not impressed because I didn't footnote. So this is already second edition, which has 55 pages of, uh, of end notes. So it's pretty well And researched. there's also the, the cover... Uh, the design won a Benjamin and Franklin Award, which means, okay. I'm going to get something. to the cover now. That's why, yeah, that's why I delayed you guys to just to bring the book. And the story goes like this. Um, so I, I, I prepared the book. We finally met our deadline to go to press. And then we're about to go to press. And I forgot something which is pretty important, which is we didn't yet have a cover for the book. No, cover to a book is a very important component. People do judge a book by a cover. <laughs> Whoever tells me they don't judge a book by its cover, <laughs> I know they never tried to sell a book. Right. <laughs> so we had to get a cover for the book in no time. So I put my team on it. That means my kids. <laughs> and we're going through archives. and uh, See, that team is bigger than yeah. most companies. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it was an assistant of mine who found this cover. And uh, this is a very dramatic picture. I don't know which, which camera to hold it this up to. Right here. Straight here. So this picture is a picture that was shot on the day that Auschwitz was liberated. It's a picture of many, many, many children. This is just a zoom in of several. And uh, this is the actual picture. This is not the picture. This was a picture taken by a it's, Soviet soldier. It's a bunch of kids. It's in black and white. For those picture, listening, and you one, should go ahead and Google heroic children, <laughs> untold mm, stories. And that's go, true. And, and the, the main, the, I guess their focal point child has color. To oh, his. oh, so what happened was, is that question. Now I'm going to put you guys in the hot seat. But it's not a hard question. Is it a history question? Don't worry. Okay, I'm very worried. <laughs> <laughs> you did well in history in high school. Oh, gosh, yeah. What is the most famous story of the Holocaust? It's a fact or an opinion? It's a fact. Famous uh, famous story picture? The, the most famous story. Fame, the most famous story. Gotcha. <laughs> and Frank. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. You mean like That's that? Your question. I okay. thought you were saying like we all know the Punovich, right? Like I don't yeah. know like something like within and like. Okay, Anne Frank. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yes, Anne now, Frank. Now Anne's story is not a reflective story. She wasn't in the ghettos, wasn't in the camps. Right. She had a roof of her head, a modicum of food, but yet it's a story, and that's I think why it became so famous. So my tour in Yad Vashem, the reason why it's so popular is because no one can deal with all the facts. It's amazing, you know. There are hundreds of tours going on at one time in Yad Vashem. It's a large museum. And there's a very large staff of tour guides. And it fritzes my brain. There are tour guides that are unspooling data that no head can absorb. So what I always do is I tell personal stories or I tell stories about individuals that connect. That way, that's how I convey the information. That's why people appreciate the tour. Okay, back to the book. We needed a cover. Now, so the copyright holder of this cover, when you publish a book on the cover, you need permission from the copyright holder. Right. The copyright holder is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. So I made a request for the picture and you have to fill out an affidavit and saying that you'll make no changes or alterations. So I said, I'm going to make this change and this change and that change and this change and this change and that change. And the next day I had permission. <laughs> wow. And, uh, but they said it's low resolution. It'll take three weeks to get it in high resolution. Three weeks. I don't know if I had three days, but you'll pardon me for being an Israeli. And I figured the connection, the way, what has to be done here is protexia, having the right connections. And I have a friend, very powerful individual. Rumor has it that in his cell phone, he has the private phone number of every senator and congressman. He lives in Baltimore. And I figured Baltimore, Washington, he must have a connection to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. That you just got to like get a picture. You know, you're, not, you're not asking <laughs> him to switch a vote in the Senate or anything. Yeah. You just need a picture. And fortunately, his son learns in yeshiva right next door. I know who you're talking about. Okay. So I run to yeshiva and I said, Aryeh, <laughs> again, I thought this is a rhetorical question. I said, Aryeh, your father's connected to United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He said, no. <laughs> Disenchanted, crestfallen, melancholy. I'm walking out of the, the room. And as I'm about to cross the threshold, he says to me, but my mother is on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to wring his neck. <laughs> it's very classic, Arya. <laughs> his mother, guy, his mother guy. is uh, Judge Chaya Friedman. So I send her off an email. I say, Chaya, I say, that's when I need your help. And here's the picture. It's this lot number, this pick number, this thing. I need it yesterday. 
high res. Now you have to realize the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is a large bureaucracy, 300 employees. They don't just turn the picture over overnight, but she's on the board. And the next day, I got the picture. Attachment, wow. Gmail, there it is. And then it occurs to me, yeah, 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 yeah. In sync with my methodology of teaching, I wanted the picture is sepia. I yeah. wanted to color one child to highlight the individual. So I write her back, I said, hi, I'm sorry, one more thing. I need you to get me permission to do, uh, to color one child. That's a, that's a significant change in a picture. And she wrote me back, she's very busy convening a murder trial and she has no time. So I prevailed upon her, said, Chaya, I said, this is killing me. And uh, she, you know, I prevailed upon her. So she writes me back the next day, yay, yay, nay, nay. I made the request. I cannot tell you they'll agree to it, but I made the request. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, this is the Holocaust. This is apple pie. This is mom, the flag. No one's going to say no. Uh, and so we have, I'm going to use the technical term. I'm almost done. The technical term is called a press queue. In the largest press in Israel, 10 o'clock at night, arguably the largest press in the Middle East, and three hours for press queue, or to be accurate, two hours and 48 minutes, I get an email from the head archivist, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, says, Dear Rabbi Teller, we regret to inform you, you may not use the picture. If you wish to use the picture in its pristine state, without zooming or any alterations or coloration, you may. But once you make a change, and particularly this boy, which you want to highlight, spoke out recently, and our legal department said unequivocally, you may not Make any change to the picture. Shrek and a half. You know, we're two and a half hours to press queue. And so, but I'm not such a pushover. And uh, I dash off an email and said, please give me his phone number and his name. I want to speak with him. One hour and 34 minutes before press queue, she sends, writes me back. We don't know his name. We don't know where he lives. I said, come on, you, you just told me that he spoke out and he's sensitive. I think it was like 41 minutes to press queue. She sends me an online clipping of this picture. And those people who were in the picture were still alive, obviously in the grip of old age, went back on the 70th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz, went to point to themselves in the picture. According to this clipping, this fellow's name was, it wasn't clear. Apparently this guy's name is Hirsch and he's from Europe. I'll use the yeshivish term. It was Mashma, his name is Hirsch and he's from Europe. And now I have 37 minutes to find Hirsch and Europe. Oh, gosh. He's the right guy. So Sherlock Teller is thinking, <laughs> where in the world? Hirsch's first name or your last name? I don't know. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know. I'm going to find this guy. I got 37 minutes to find Hirsch and Europe. You have an exciting life. Yeah. So Sherlock Teller is thinking, where would this guy? Now, if you look at the picture, the guy looks pretty good. So I knew he couldn't be a Pole. Can't be a Pole. To look this good, you got to be Hungarian. <laughs> Shout out to the Poles. <laughs> Can't be, you have to be Hungarian because Hungary All was invaded in March. listeners are very yeah. upset. No, yeah. no, I'm going to explain. Hungary was invaded in March 1944. To me, this shape, you'd have to be Pole was 39. I mean, mm. he looked like he was like well-fed. Yeah, he was much better shape. Yeah. He, the, the other ones look, I don't know. So he had to have been a Hungarian. So Sherlock Teller is thinking, where would Hungarian survivor of Auschwitz live in Europe today? So I discounted uh, England... Russia, Eurasia, Israel. So I only have around 28 countries to go in about 24 minutes. And I concluded it's going to have to be Belgium or, Hol or ben ben Belgium or Switzerland. And I have a really good friend, Moshe Luzer, who lives in uh, Zurich. I'm sure he's a good guy. And no, sorry. That's terrible. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Is he Hasidish? He's, yes, he's a bunch what, of what, okay. Why does that matter? No, because he's a loser. <laughs> That's the last name, no? No, Moshe, Moshe Eliezer. Oh, okay. So Moshe, I say, I say, Moshe Luzer, he lives in Zurich and he works for IBM. What a shidduch. You know, this okay, guy's going to find it for me. So I called, now we're 11 minutes to press queue. I said, Moshe Luzer, I need you to find me Hirsch in Switzerland. He said, would that be his first name or his last name? Because it could be either name. I said, I don't know. I, he said to me, is he religious? I don't know. He said, what does he do? I don't know. He said, Chano, what have you been drinking? <laughs> I'm not drinking anything. I got eight minutes. I got to find this guy. I'm lose it. So he said to me, you give me his name. I got IBM, my fingertips. I'll find him. I said, you know what? You know what? I'm sure he's Hungarian. That Try Gavor or Tibor Hirsch. Gavor Tibor is Hungarian for Mike or Steve. I hear him typing. He says, Gavor Hirsch, 84-year-old engineer. Here's his phone number. Six minutes to press queue. I call him up. And my Hoyche Deutsch. I speak to him, I ask permission, he gives me permission, 
and I fire off an email to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I have permission. Here's his phone number if you don't trust me. It's nine o'clock at night in Switzerland. Now I wouldn't call him at this hour. He's an elderly gentleman. And I have at home a beautiful picture of uh, Gavr holding the book. That's amazing. Gavr passed away this summer. Right. But uh, I took that as an I just want you to know wow. that it'd be harder for me to parallel park than to get this guy on one call. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're late to this interview. <laughs> right, that's why I was late. <laughs> wow. So I you didn't have a coin to park. <laughs> so at the end of it, you got the book to him and you got, you got yeah, him holding it. It's incredible. It yeah. Uh, Moshe Winner, we should have changed your friend's name to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is really beautiful. <laughs> that is great. I, yeah, you, I gave me, you gave me this when I was living in Israel. You gave me the first edition. I have to pick yeah. up the second edition. Yeah. That's it's really beautiful. Difference. Wow. Is Very, that, yeah. we were talking, you said you have a draw dropping story. I assume this is the draw drop. Yeah. This is that, that is incredible. Like, you have a very like exciting life. <laughs> you realize that? The stories always happen to you. Yeah. I don't know. But. <laughs> How do you like, you, you're very busy, you do a lot of stuff and you, this is definitely a stressful moment, but you're, you're, you seem present. at least, yeah, you're very present. You're very calm. At, what do you attribute that to? Uh, I'm not a nervous person, but I, I have a lot to get done and I have to just focus on doing it. I'm not necessarily quick. You know, this talent of being multitasking, that's not me. No. I can barely unitask. Amazing how a woman, woman can talk on the phone, do the dishes, yell at the kids, li and listen to a tape in the background. When I talk on the phone, <laughs> I'm looking at the phone. I, but what I do is I, I'm not a big sleeper. I spend a lot of time on what I do. I have a secret also, which I guess I'll reveal, is I read. Most people don't expect to know things without reading. So I'll read and I'll study. And I teach a lot and I, I prepare it. I don't go up to speak unless I'm prepared. And, uh, and I speak a lot. I was at as Shev Brachas, and a relative, a uh, brother of a relative of mine, said to me, Chanoch, now I understand why they pay you to speak. So I said to him, I said, he also spoke to Shev Brachas. I said, did you prepare? He said, of course I prepared. I said, how much you prepare? I opened up the Orachim, I took a look. I said, I prepared three and a half hours. People don't usually do that for a Shev Brachas, but... Uh, but you, you spend so, that being said, you don't really, you know, you're not really a multitasker, and you spend a lot of time preparing, You've gotten so much done, and you're 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 just you're you're not like you know <laughs> twenty seven twenty seven. Yeah. You know, you're not an old man. For people listening, they don't see you. Mm. <laughs> He's not twenty seven. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, twenty eight. Um, you're you're not. You know, you're. How do you how do you like how do you do that? Because um, I mean, is it as simple as people who try to do everything at once get less done, and since you're doing things one at a time, mm. you're getting more done? How does that? No, you have to be disciplined. You know, ultimately, and how much? How little do you sleep? Also, like, what you see, you said you don't sleep a lot. Like, very little. I sleep very little. little. And you're working when you're not sleeping. Yes. Okay. That's no, an I'm advantage. not lying in bed doing nothing. That's <laughs> that's never going to happen. That's an advantage. Uh, now I feel like actually I need a little, since COVID, I, I feel like I need more sleep. So, uh, but I try and, and try and get things done. I'm disciplined. Uh, you can't do everything, so you have to figure out what's really important and eliminate those things which aren't so important. And it's hard because a lot of people enter, you know, when you have a large family, everybody wants your attention and there's issues which you have to help them with. You can't run away from that. In other words, all the things I'm doing, let's say professionally, writing, speaking, there's three films. Podcasting. Um, the podcast now is, yeah, yeah. Podcast. I, I have no idea. I mean, call up about you guys. Uh, I am, my episode is 20 minutes. I've so far I've recorded I, I mean on air I've there's maybe six or seven that are up already, but I've already pre recorded about twenty of them. I don't like running, you know, getting late for something. I don't like owing money. I don't right. like I don't like doing things last minute. Every episode has taken me over sixteen hours to prepare. Wow. Sixteen hours to prepare twenty for twenty minutes. minutes. It's efficient. You got to uh, do what we do. We just bring in the interesting people and yeah, uh, we let them talk. We did a little research before, but, but uh, anyways, let, let's do it a little further. Let's call it Teller from Jerusalem. That's the name. Yeah, Teller yeah. From Jerusalem. Right, and people can find it on on every platform. Apple, Spotify. So, so I mean, this is great because you know, Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of people listening to this, and they're they're gonna hop on over and listen. I'm sure hmm. a lot of people know about it, but for those that don't know about your podcast, what, okay. what's it about? What's it about? It's every. It's a 20 minute podcast. It feature drops every week there's a new episode and it's about the early struggle to build the state of israel 
But if you've mm. ever heard me speak, there's a lot of stories, and I go off on tangents and tangents to tangents. Uh, I'm teaching history in a way that it's very memorable. How many tangents can you go on in 20 minutes? Uh, <laughs> and there's a 16 hour preparation. <laughs> does, yeah. does, does that, the tangent is not in the head. I've, is the uh, tangent in the 16 hour preparation? In my preparation, I, I, I realize there's tangents? something that I want to talk about, and so I'll go off on there. And, uh, <laughs> Was, Maybe that's why I take 16 hours. And then it's, every three weeks, it's about the building the state of Israel. And once a month, it's uh, on, we call it a, uh, I, I call it honorable mention, but it's really a character workshop. And there's an opportunity also to go off on things that, that are important, because this is one of the things I teach in seminary. And uh, What's an example of a character workshop? Stand. Example would be, if I would create a new term, it would be cell phone, that's old, old, smartphone decorum. There are times that it's not appropriate to speak on a phone. People are speaking to me and they're... Uh, hmm. Swiping. Uh, to me, that's akin, yeah, swiping. To me, that's akin to talking to someone and reading a novel. Hmm. Uh, there are times it's not appropriate to have a, phone, a cell phone on. I, I'm aware that sometimes, you know, I forget to turn it off, but I've been at funerals where a phone goes off. Okay, you forget to turn it off. But what I'll never get is how do people take the call? Right. I was once at a funeral, it was last summer, and I came home and I told the I was at the Shabbos table, I told him I was at the funeral and a phone went off and a person took the call. And my kid said right away, it must have been a doctor. I said, I don't think this 15-year-old girl <laughs> is a doctor. And uh, people are on buses. Providence places you in a crowded place, crowded restaurant, crowded uh, bus. People talk so loud on their phone. Pe you know, people will, you know, I think the excuse for keeping the phone on is, what if my kids need to reach me? What if my wife needs to reach me? I think, I mean, you have 18 children, and if you mm -hmm. can shut your phone off, I mean, I don't know if there's a minute in your day where one of your kids are not trying mm -hmm. to reach you. If, and if you could shut your phone off, that's that's actually very like um, that's a very. I was also even though I'm 27, I was born before the day that ever had a phone, so we managed fine without it. Probably managed better imagine, without it. But can you imagine? <laughs> but can you imagine being born with it though? Like it's it's a struggle. It, it's it's a foreign concept to shut it. And I just have shut with it. my students. I work with them on this. That uh, what's the, you want to be in the driver's seat. What's if the, the phone is in the driver's seat? You know, it used to be you know you don't leave the house without a wallet. Now the phone, it's an umbilical cord. You have to be able to cut it. Uh, if I came here without my phone and forgot it, I 100% would go back. I would need to. I mean, I'm saying the well, like diagnosis we just went of my through addiction. A yontif, three day yontif, we didn't have, it, felt, it probably felt great, no? Like, it felt great, but there's certain points where like my brain is like, I'm a little bored now. You feel your leg buzzing, no? Nah, Every, nah. Yes, I have that all the time. Phantom, I feel Phantom, my, I feel my leg, like, and I just <laughs> reach for it, and then I'm like, slack on me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, could, could you give us a, a small, quick tidbit about the building of uh, Israel from, you know, I'm, I know you prepare for 16 hours, but I, it's just something, something oh, interesting. Oh, uh, building of Israel. Just in uh, regards to the podcast. The history. Uh, there are people, there are some heroes that are very well known. Name like Herzl, Ben-Gurion, these are mm -hmm. well-known people. Mm -hmm. And there's many people that are unsung heroes that were very significant and their dedication was incredible. Uh, also, uh, Eliezer Ben-Yehuda who created a Hebrew language. I mean, he didn't make up the words. Well, he actually did. In many ways, he did make up the words. Uh, what he did was nighly impossible, uh, somewhat of a controversial per person. Uh, what I'm talking about now is uh, Herbert Samuel, it's named new, after Herbert Samuel Street. There's a new uh, hotel in Ben Yehuda, Herbert, Herbert Samuel. Oh. That's because that's so interesting. interesting. He was named after the hotel movie. <laughs> <laughs> so Herbert no, Samuel, yes, he was named after the hotel and after the street. So Herbert Samuel was the first Jewish vice, the first Jewish ruler in a mandatory authority in Palestine. First mm -hmm. leader in Israel, a Jew in 2,000 years. He was a good person. He was a well-intentioned person. Uh, he was also somewhat influential in the Balfour Declaration. Uh, but he felt because of the Arabs initially, he had to be a little more balanced. So he appointed Hajim al Husseini to be the waqf in, in Jerusalem. Al Husseini was an extremely evil man. Uh, he thought that during the Holocaust, that children who had permission to come to Israel would not come. He said that it would upset the balance, and so they were sent to death. He then went to Germany, encouraged German troops. He had Arab troops go there. Uh, he was the one responsible for the Tarpat and Damascus in 1929 in Hebron. So Herbert Samuel, he made a big mistake. He was a good person. But you have to know that there are times. So we get, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm making mistakes. And sometimes you'll be remembered from a mistake. You guys ever hear of Bill... No, Bill Buckney. Bill Buckney. Mookie Wilson? 
Oh, you mean you mean uh, Buckner? Bill Buckner. Bill Buck- Buckner. Yeah, through the legs. Red through Sox. the legs. Yes. It's the I'm a, I'm a Met fan, so that's like their one shining our one shining moment in the last yeah. three decades. Yeah, I have no so, clue what you're talking about. This guy Bill Buckner was a first baseman for the Red Sox, and Mookie he was Wilson. a decorated player. He was very, he was very All well. Star. The ball he started Israel. No, <laughs> <laughs> Mookie Wilson hit, hit the ball and it, and it went through his legs, and the Mets won the game, which they ended up going to I guess the won seventh the, game. They won the, the World, World Series. The World Series, and. Um, there's a he had to go into hiding, Bill Buckner. He he had to. Oh, really? the, the and you know, he's a good player. He made one error. And defined his entire his career. He wanted to look to a depression. There's a uh, there's a uh, bridge in Boston called the Buckner uh, the Bunker Hill Bridge. That's where people like jump that. off of, like, and has legs, and the cars go through it. So they called it the Buckner Bridge <laughs> because he's like notorious. This is all he's known for, and he was a great player right. before it happened. Well, that like this story, mm-hmm. this scares me. It makes mm-hmm. me anxious. Like, oh man, going through life. Like, if you make one mistake, you're done. No, the important thing is if you everyone makes mistakes, you can just fall don't down. do it on the a baseball field in Game is, Seven, <laughs> Game Six. Uh, game six. Uh, but the important thing is is that you everyone makes mistakes. Everyone falls down. The important thing is to remember to get back up. Mm. A plane which flies from New York to Los Angeles, eighty five percent of the route is being constantly, dynamically, perpetually vectored back on course. But the bottom line, it lands in the right runway, in the right airport, in the right city. It's one hundred percent success. Falling down is not a mistake. Staying down is a mistake. But what if the mistake is just so bad? Like for Buckner, mm-hmm. it, it was too bad. Boston did not give him an opportunity to get back up. He was mm-hmm. he was done. How do, how do you get out from that? I mean, most of the things like Herbert's, best thing is to try and rectify the mistake. What he can't do is there, I mean, he could have done so much to make people who have errors and that they're condemned for you the mean rest own of their it. lives. Yeah. Just own it. That's the word. Or supreme own it. You know, it's got Jocko, Jocko Wilner. He okay. wrote a book called Extreme Ownership. And they had to take over this building in Afghanistan. In like like Iraq. this in, in, in Parsha Shmini where Moshe Rabbeinu, right. he owned his, he owned his, his uh, right. mistake to our own. And he said, you cannot you rectify it. unless you own it. And that's, that's Super the key important, lesson. Yeah. And all this we talk about, we're talking about the building of Israel. We're going right through mistakes and we get into the World Series and get in. <laughs> and this guy, Jack, over there, they were taking out this building in Iraq. And just, you know, and he's a SEAL. He's the head of a SEAL team. SEAL is the... If you ever see this guy, he can't pick his nose. He's so muscular. <laughs> Maybe that's not so idle way of putting it, but he, he looks Hopefully like... He has someone he's very buff. Him. He's very buff. Yeah. Very buff. Yeah, better. You'll turn it. And uh, so he's a SEAL, and uh, he's had a team, and there's also a friendly Iraqi force, and they're going to take over this building. And as all of a sudden, there's friendly fire. That's the catastrophe of catastrophes. So he calls off the mission. There's one Iraqi soldier, which is dead. One SEAL is seriously injured. And then he has a debrief... And he's about to go into the meeting. And there's so many people who give, you know, put blame on the communication person and this person, this person. He said, there's only one person responsible. I was the commander of the team. Otherwise, I can't be a man. I can't own up to, I have to own up to what I've done wrong. Otherwise, I'm the ego's in the driver's seat instead of me. And that's that's an important lesson. So you you gotta, can rectify when you own the mistake. So you, su- you suggest people to really just, it's okay to make mistakes, just own it. And, and, right. and say my bad. Because I feel, just my personal opinion is people who don't own mistakes, and same, same with me, it happens all the time, is the longer you don't own a mistake, the longer that mistake ends up hurting you. It's going to fester. Yeah. And metastasize. And won't, and you won't you get own. over it. And the second you, the second you like just... I mean, like take take someone who's like playing mm-hmm. playing a a game of baseball and he and he he misses he he's trying to catch a ball and he misses the ball. Everyone's looking at him. In the moment, had he just said, "My bad, my bad," everyone would have gone over it. But if mm-hmm. he's blaming this and that, everyone's thinking like, maybe you should have caught it, you know. Yeah. So yeah. we have a few uh, fun, interesting type of questions that we ask to the end. But baseline I w- vitals. I want to I want to talk about right before that. Um, the fact that I think this is very interesting. The fact that you're a runner, you're, you're you look like you're in great shape for for 28. Yeah, you look like you're in, <laughs> no, no, but even aside for the besides for your age, you're also obviously a very accomplished and and respectful tamachacham. But you're also you're very into running. I, I find that very well, inspiring for I, myself. Running, I, I regret. I well, I started running only five years ago. So uh, I guess I have the advantage now. If I came from England, advantage of. Uh, <laughs> I have low mileage, but I, I do it religiously. I run three times a week. And that's also part of, uh, if you want to get things done, you have to be disciplined. No matter what, I, I try and run three times a week. This morning, it, I stayed up all night long and then the shit looking, but I, I did run before I came here. Really? I, I really? Did rain. you run the, the, the Brockway Boardwalk? I, I didn't run nice. there this morning. I've run oh, there. But uh, yeah, nice. I ran from 
uh, all the way down Woodmere up to Cedarhurst and came back. I would love someone like coming out of their house and like just like just waking up like you're a teacher like 15 years ago and they're like, did Rav Hadoch tell us oh, just run me? by me? Just we this morning, to, well, all the time. Really? You know, people honk. We need, a Jewish t- we need a Jewish TMZ. <laughs> 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 is rolling when you're walking out of your house and you you pick that up so late in life yeah it was about time no, like, my wife that's so me. interesting you're starting you're just still you're just you know i want to i want to run no i've been athletic i've been doing things like I, i'm like i'm 26 and i'm like i don't run like but why not i could run like you <laughs> just decided you're gonna run yeah that's awesome uh well, I exercise in Hebrew University and they have a track there so it was pretty convenient i started on the track and now i run the streets my wife, you know, my wife, she's embarrassed that I run around our Zerbira, but, uh, but she says, even though she's embarrassed, she says, I always hear people saying, Rabbi Teller can run. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, you, do you ever encounter folks that maybe aren't folks. used to Yidin running or they know what Yidin are and you get into... <laughs> Uh, my friend you told me Jew, you're Jewish and you run? Like, yeah. I know Jews can run. Like, no, I say you have a big beard and you're running. I was once running in a, uh, it's like a Korean neighborhood. <laughs> and so the guys in the windows going, go Jew, go. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's mostly motivating. <laughs> you, 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 b- before we were talking and you mentioned how you were running once and you were very inspired by people. You thought that they were, I don't remember. A, oh, yes. I reminded me of a story. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I give a, a small shear in Shivata Kotel. And I have a colleague there who's buff. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like an athlete, smells like an athlete. Well, it doesn't smell. He looks like an athlete, and he is an athlete. And it was my second race, and we got to the starting line at the same time. And he said to me, we, we just got there at the same time, and he said to me that Mr. Marathon, I don't know his name, Pythagius, Pythagoras, whatever, the guy who ran from Sparta to okay. Marathon, or from Greece, from we ran to Marathon. It was a twenty-six point two mile run, and when he got there, he said he he dropped dead. So I said to my friend, "I'm not sure this is the most opportune time to tell me this." <laughs> and he said to me, "On the contrary, if you finish a run and you have energy to keep on going, you didn't run it correctly." And that was so much inspiration for me. And I ran so fast. It gave me such a kick. I ran so fast. I beat my Talmudim. I couldn't get my head through the door for the next three weeks. <laughs> but my father then became very ill. My father was a robust person. The last three months of his life, I had to feed him. I had to breathe for him. I had to change him. And I had that metaphor. It's the end of the race. I just have to be here for him. And many people, Lo Elena, the Rabbi Salavajic spoke about this one. Part of the, part of the Avelis is feeling you could have done more. And I was spared that because I had to finish that race with everything. I was on a speaking tour in Montreal, and I stopped. I just went for Shabbos, and I came right, because I couldn't say no to them for Shabbos. And I came right back to be with my father. And I wanted to finish that race, and I had that great consolation. And in many things in life, to give it your all. Mm. Uh, That's Make sure the tank is empty, you know? So, okay, the question, first question we're going to ask you is... I just want to tell you, I I feel only right, because we spoke before about the podcast, Teller from Jerusalem. Zevi Kaufman got me started on that. I love Zevi. Zevi Kaufman, the man. He's great. Okay, He's great. So, and uh, all right. Shout out to Zevi Kaufman. Zevi. Yeah. Okay. If, if, if you Language were, of My Soul. He has well, that album. He, yeah, he's a great musician, great vocalist. If you were sitting, could sit down with anyone in history who's no longer alive, you pick somebody and sit down and talk to them for an hour, who would it be? Uh, I have... I, I, it's a toss-up for me. On the one hand, Michal Ber, Michal Ber Weismandel, mm-hmm. they both, the two I'm going to mention, have the same thing in common. Okay. He was a remarkable person who uh, went through the Holocaust. He uh, negotiated with the Slovakians during the war. He had a yeshiva going under German occupation for quite a while. Uh, he managed to jump out of the train going to Auschwitz, and he began again. He lost his wife, he lost his children. He made a yeshiva in Mount Kisco, New York. Remarkable story. Uh, the person who, and a person who went through what he went through, you, he would have a legitimate reason to be angry at God, angry at the world. He was a man of ultimate Ehrlichkeit, integrity. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't, he didn't bear a grudge against non Jews. I'm sure he had no, was no great fan of, uh, of the Germans. He wasn't a great fan of the Zionists either. But uh, the, the kind of integrity that he lived, he lived and what he did to try and save people 
under conditions where most people buckled. That's one person I would love to meet, to have met, to love to meet. And I feel something about the Panevich Rav, whose biography I wrote in the, in the book Builders, because Panevich Rav also the same thing. He managed to come out of Europe. There were 18 yeshivas that were destroyed in Lithuania, and he was determined to make the great renaissance of the yeshiva world. Now, we all know Rabbi Aaron Cutler brought Torah to America, but the renaissance of the yeshiva movement in many, many ways is the Panevich Rav, and that's also a great uh, Yerusha I got from Rav Nissen Alpert. You know, it takes one to know one to know a great speaker. And uh, Nissen Alpert was probably the best speaker I ever heard. And he said he never heard a good speaker, a, a speaker as great as the point of a hmm. And that intrigued me. That's why I ended up learning about him and then writing about him. So that's, I think those are the two. That that's really right. really uh, what would you say is your, your mitzvah or a mitzvah that you gravitate towards more than the others that you uh, As we spoke somewhat, the idea of Shidduchim, I'm very committed to doing whatever I can. It, shidduchim takes a lot of time. It's not thinking about it, inquiring, meeting people. It takes a lot. It hemorrhages time. So that's dear to me. And my wife and I together, I think, we, uh, hmm. she loves to do it. And uh, we, I have no idea what the stats are, but we have a lot of people coming over. So I guess those were the two. Each time you ask me for one, I give you two. That's perfect. Yeah, that's and fine. We'll, uh, we'll end with this one, I guess. What's the the best advice you've ever been given? Hmm. Can I tell you my best and worst advice together? Sure. Yeah. It's one in the same. Yes. Oh, it is? Yeah. Interesting. Let's okay. hear it. Um, I learned in yeshiva in Israel, and I started writing articles. And uh, there was a Rebbe. He wasn't my Rebbe, but he's a Rebbe in yeshiva. Big time chacham, an American. And he said to me, he said, Chanoch, don't think you're going to be a writer. You know, so you published an article too. Don't, don't think this is going to, your future is not writing. And he hurt my ego. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I Dafka wanted to do it because he yeah. said not to. So and then the funny thing was, is that I was in America. I was on a speaking tour. He then moved back to America, become Roshiva somewhere. And he was tracing me. Like we didn't have cell phones then. And I was in Houston, I got a call, he was looking for me and I had left. And then mm -hmm. I was in New Orleans and he had just missed me. And I was in Birmingham, Alabama, he just missed me. I was in Miami, he had just missed me. Finally, I called him up, he said, he's, he's got a sheet, he wants me to write a brochure for it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is like the ultimate. You know? <laughs> and I did it, I was very busy. But I thought that this guy was so instrumental in my writing career by encouraging me not to write that I, I owed him that much. Wow, <laughs> you're appreciative, Tim. Yeah, it was that's my so, best, so, best worst that's advice. Amazing. That's so awesome. Um, so for uh, you mentioned your podcast, uh, Tell It From Jerusalem. Where, where else, what else are you up to that if people want to find out more about you, where could they go? Okay, I have a website. My name with three W's in front of it. Mm -hmm. Your name with- Hanoch without a C. With H-A-N-O-C. Yeah, let right? me ask you, I know we're doing this at the end. I should have done this meeting. Are you, is your name Hanoch Teller or Hanoch Teller? Like which one is it? Depends it's, if you can say the ch or not. <laughs> no, like mm -hmm. do you- No, what? it's Hanoch. It is Hanoch. But you yeah. always write it as Hanoch. Well, I didn't, well, I, you know, when you get a name, usually your parents would do it. But it makes sense to me, a chet and a chaf are not the same letters, so. You make a distinction. Mm. One's an H and one's a... Right. Okay, so hanochteller.com. Hanochteller.com, there's... Most of my information is there. It, the, one of the most interesting features was coming events where I was going to speak. And uh, you could probably access there the old places. It's interesting. I've been all around, around the world many times. There are probably very good speakers. I'm sure there's very good speakers. I, I'm... Rabbi Sachs was... Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not in his league. Rabbi Beryl Wine, who I'm close with. Uh, so, when I hear him speak, I feel like I hear a Navi speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're great speakers, but I think I've probably spoken more than anyone all over. You know, I was going every three weeks traveling for decades. I've spoken in so many different places. Um, how did we get onto this? Because you're saying about your website. Oh, uh, so the website was an interesting feature is what's where I'm going. So that all stopped with uh, the pandemic. Yeah. Rich Jim, it should continue. It should continue again. Oh, from your mouth. <laughs> Oh man. Oh man. Hey. Well, Rabbi Hanach Teller, thank you so much for, for making this happen. You're someone who every minute of yours is, is valuable. And, and Kol really... Yaakov, he was, he, he contacted me. I didn't, when he first asked Yaakov's me to come on to the show. Yeah. yeah. I can't deny that. I didn't even know what a podcast was. And now I have one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long you've been trying There's to get a, Yeah. There we, you go. We, we, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that like we contact people sometimes, in, even in your case, is probably a, almost a year ago but we wanted to do this in person and we couldn't until now because of the pandemic and Baruch Hashem, mm -hmm. you're, I have to thank your, your son and yeah, daughter-in-law for having the baby for yeah, you coming Baruch in yeah. okay so only more simchas I mean, I mean thank you so much pleasure so much 
<laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that episode with the one and only Rabbi Hanoch Teller. But if you want to hear a little more about Rabbi Hanoch Teller, read his books, check out his podcast, you could go to hanochteller.com. That's H-A-N-O-C-H-T-E-L-L-E-R.com. Go check it out. There's a lot to see, a lot to listen to, a lot to watch. Um, I want to say two things. Sure. First off, I- actually say only one. You're allowed one. Okay. The one thing I want to say, and then I'll say another thing, is that I, we hope you like the new album artwork. Yeah. Um, Shout out Yocheved Herzog. Yeah. Amazing. And also uh, Naftali. Naftali Golgrab. Who took the picture. Incredible and, photographer. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's so amazing. Um, so we hope you guys like it. I, you know, it's a shift from what we did before. If you don't, just it's okay. There are things in life you don't like. You just <laughs> give it to yourself. No, but we <laughs> like it that like, it's funny. Sometimes we meet people and they're, they're not sure. Like, is, is Nahi the one with the brown hair or the orange hair? Is Yaakov the one with the brown hair? Really? Did that ever happen? Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that I wanted to say is, oh, yeah, um, I get chizik when people come over to me and say, like, oh, by the way, I love the podcast. It, every single time someone, at the, I mean, I, people come over and have other things to say. But when they, they have good feedback, I really appreciate it. And I know, I'm sure Nahi, you feel this too, like sometimes... I kind of feel like people hovering and they're not sure. They maybe don't want to say, maybe they're shy or maybe they, I don't want us to get too egotistical maybe because that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's amazing when people give us real feedback in real life and, and it, it, yeah. If you ever see us in a restaurant, you could just send dessert and drinks to our table. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's also okay. Acceptable. I, I think unlike Amari, yeah. like if you want to come over and talk to us while we're eating in a restaurant, I'll take it. <laughs> And we're not like that level. So you can go to Yaakov all. while he's eating. Oh, not Nafi. Okay, fine. <laughs> no, you can go. I'm all game. Yeah. Anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed this episode. And um, yeah, Yaakov has nice sneakers. Ciao. <laughs>